hello and welcome to Cure America. I'm Star Parker. And I have returned with some regularity over the last few years, comparing what is going on in our country today to what was going on in the 1850s, the years preceding the Civil War. America's always been about freedom of expression, and that freedom has often led to protest and tension. Generally, we've gotten through these tough times, these challenging times, and then we've moved on. But what caused everything to break down in the 1850s leading up to the horrible Civil War? The answer, I think, is to understand the distinction between plurality of opinion and plurality of values. Plurality of opinion is natural. It's vital to human reality and why freedom and democracy are so important. Each individual is unique and sees the world in his or her unique way. On issues of difference or debate, to reach common ground, each must be able to bring their own opinion, their own perspective, to the table. But plurality of values is different altogether. In order to have the dialogue necessary to tolerate plurality of opinion, we must be on the same page on how we comprehend truth. The folks in the discussion or the debate must have the same core values. When there's no consensus on the most basic common beliefs, on our most basic universal truths, the ability of being able to communicate and conduct civil discourse breaks totally down. We may have different opinions about health care and education, foreign policy, and climate change. But in the 1850s, the differences were about the nature of man, whether blacks were human beings or whether slavery should be tolerated. This was a breakdown in values, not in opinions. And once it was evident that two competing worldviews were at root of the conflict, the basis for civil discourse was gone. The country broke into war with brother killing brother. And although supposedly this current tension is about police brutality, I think this is a smokescreen. Police brutality is indeed a problem. And it is possible to have civil discourse about how to deal with this problem. One issue that should be part of the discussion, in my opinion, is police unions. The unions make it almost impossible to take meaningful punitive action against officers with a track record of poor behavior. Don't agree with me? So let's discuss it. If solving the problem of aggressive policing is what all of this tension in our streets is about, we can do something. But the violence that is raking our cities shows there is more going on. Police brutality is being used as an excuse for something more basic. It is being used as an excuse to reject our nation and the truths upon which our country were founded. This becomes really obvious in a new book called In Defense of Looting by Vicki Osterwell. In this book, which interestingly is actually being recognized in high society intellectual circles, Osterwell justifies looting as a legitimate form of protest. She says the very basis of property in the U.S. is derived through whiteness and through black oppression. Well, this is a point of departure from a difference of opinion to difference in core values. So I thought we should think about the breakdown of civil debate this week on Cure America. I have some very special guests again to weigh in on a critical question. In fact, a couple of questions. Like what should be done to stop one group of Americans from destroying the property of a fellow American simply because that group has a cause that they believe needs national attention? Another question would be, have we reached a tipping point, like in the 1850s, to where our national political leaders cannot speak with one voice on this destruction because of the different and conflicting worldviews they hold? What has happened in our society that far too many fellow citizens believe that their political opinions are more important than getting to peace for the common good? Interesting questions, causing much concern and a lot of debate and fear. So you're also going to hear from my distinguished panel to help us sort through the noise of the news to find some truth. I'm excited to dive into this discussion with you, and we will right after this very important message. Hello, I'm Franklin Graham. Right now, we're in Alaska unloading a hospital for uh, COVID-19. 
But right now our country is in trouble and people are scared, people are afraid and we see the violence and the injustices that are taking place. Only God can change this. Uh, this is a problem of the human heart and we have sinned against God and as a nation we've turned our back on God. And I want you to know that God loves you, He cares for you, and He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, from heaven to this earth to take our sins. And if we'll confess them and repent, turn from them and believe on His Son, Jesus Christ, God will forgive us and He'll heal our hearts. If you have never invited Christ into your heart, pray this prayer with me right now. Just say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry, forgive me. I believe Jesus Christ is your Son. I want to trust Him as my Savior. I want to follow Him as Lord from this day forward forever. Amen. Uh, call that number right now that's on the screen. We've got someone who will pray with you, talk with you, and encourage you. God bless. Welcome back, and I want you to meet a very special friend. We've been on the front lines of a lot of battles for quite some many years now, Penny Nance. Penny is a dear friend but she's also the president of Concerned Women for America. Welcome, Penny. Thanks, Star. What an honor to be on your new show. I'm so excited about being here with you. Well, I appreciate it, but unfortunately, it's a difficult time, and I think that when we're thinking about what is happening with all debate breaking down, civil order breaking down, women all across America that you represent must be really concerned. They are, and, um, and, and I know firsthand why that it's important to have, uh, you know, order, ha to have lawfulness, to have the police, to have the support that we need in order to have a strong civil society. Um, this past June was the 24th anniversary of a very sad milestone for me personally. Um, I was pregnant with my daughter my first child, um, and I was attacked while, while out on a running path in Virginia by a complete stranger. Um, I was physically assaulted. I was not raped because a woman, a angel. beautiful angel, an African-American woman who didn't know me at all, stopped her car. She was a single mom, had her child in the car, and stopped her car and got involved and stopped me from being assaulted. Right. And so, um, you know, it was, you know, one of those life-changing moments. It was traumatic and, you know, there's so much around that that I'm still to this day sorting out, honestly, survivor guilt and so many things. But, oh, the, but the important point I made recently um, in, a, in a piece on CNS News was when we called the police and she called the police, they came immediately. And through good detective work, were able to f find him, yes. and he went to prison right. for, and is still a sexual, registered sexual predator. Right. You know what's intriguing about your story is that the dynamics that are involved in your life now, forever in your life, that moment of transition, are what we're debating, or supposed to be debating. You had race factors involved, you had police factors involved, you had fear, violence, all of the components that now are in our streets, as if there's no such thing as justice in our society, as if we as civil people can't have a common value that we are going to uh, come together when we see um, whether it's police brutality or just right. criminal behavior. So I want you to talk to us for a moment about what you're hearing from your women, mm -hmm. that, the ones that you represent. Tell us a little bit about your organization for those Thank that you. don't know Concerned Women for America. They perhaps know Beverly LaHaye, right, uh, but yes. they don't know you maybe. Yes, yes. And I want you to just tell them because they, they're that woman. Mm -hmm. These streets are dangerous right now. Mm -hmm. And some are saying that the tension has reached the point of no mm -hmm. return, that mm -hmm. we are not going to be able to solve this in traditional ways of voting mm -hmm. booth or civil discussion. Well, um, 
Thank you for giving me an opportunity to, to talk about Concerned Women for America is the nation's largest public policy women's organization. Yes. We're pro-life, we're yes. conservative. Yes. Uh, Beverly LaHaye founded us yes. 40 years ago yes. and we've been going strong ever since. Yes, we have yeah. members all over the country. <laughs> yes. We also have Young Women for America. Yes. We have 40 college yes. um, presidents around the country yes. on, on university campuses. Um, and we're doing, you know, just important grassroots, we're grassroots activist Christian women and unapologetically yeah. so. And to represent mm -hmm. women and, and they've got to be wondering what is this about and when will it stop? Mm -hmm. What we're seeing in the streets needs to stop. We do need law and order. There are good people like that angel that came and yes. rescued you. Yes. A complete stranger. Yes. And I think women are at this um, pivotal moment. And I particularly think this is an Esther moment, shall we say, for conservative women, for Christian women to speak up and to share our voices and to understand that we understand unity, but unity is based in truth That's right. and God's truth. Yes. And, uh, and we can love each other. Right. We can love each other no matter what. And we can protect each other. Right. And that means what you just said. Standing up against um, injustice and kindness, whether it is, you know, because police are still people and people are broken and those things do happen. But at the same time, we can also understand that we need the police. I mean, I think it was James Madison who said, if men were angels, we wouldn't need government. Yeah. Well, as I learned, men are not angels. I learned it personally and I learned it deeply. That's right. That's right. And That's so right. I needed government. That's I right. needed the That's police right. and I received justice. And you saw the system work. And I think right. that that's some of the disappointment of those that are following closely this whole Black Lives Matter movement is it's not justice that they're looking for. They're looking to overthrow mm -hmm. America. Mm -hmm. And I think it is time that women stand up and protect our interests, our families' interests. So I'm wondering now about the, the mobility of, mm -hmm. of your group. I know that you guys have a get out the vote campaign we and you're do. working on other mm -hmm. areas for people to uh, engage. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I first want to say I think you're right. There are a group of people and it's certainly not everyone. By the way, you and I are out there every January protesting, mm -hmm. right? And I almost want to do this like side by side of oh. pro life protesters and people burning things oh. and be like, this is how you do oh. it. Well, so. In fact, I've just pointed out recently that we don't we don't burn down builders, we don't shake down companies, we don't threaten people. They're smiling. People. I've got my baby, I have my <laughs> children like, with yes, me, you know, they're strollers. Every single January, here we come yeah. and we leave the city cleaner than when, when, uh, right. when we, the way we found it. But you're exactly right. And so, so you're, but you're, that's one way to protest. Mm -hmm. But another is to battle in the voting booth. Sure. And I don't want to run out of time before sure. you let folks know that there are those opportunities. Yes, well, and I, what we're doing an initiative called She Prays, She Votes. Yeah. And going around the country in the key battleground states, and every Thursday we're doing a prayer event okay. and encouraging women to pray for our nation. Yes. In fact, we have our, our phone alarm set for noon every single day. Wow. And at Concerned Women for America, we're asking everyone to pray for our country at noon. But then we're going to make sure that Frederick Douglass said, I prayed for freedom for 20 years, but God didn't answer my prayers until I prayed with my legs, until right? Up, and up. so we're praying, you know, to paraphrase him. So we yeah, are praying with our legs. We get up off our knees and we do stuff. So register to vote. Make sure you're registering your friends and family, like-minded people. And then on election day, go vote your values and call all your friends and make sure they do and babysit for your neighbor who needs the help. Right. And let's make sure that pro-life, conservative, Christian women show up and make our perspective heard. I think it's important, and in particular on this, this, this season, mm -hmm. um, most Americans are just now becoming familiar with what you and I know firsthand. We've been fighting these battles for quite some time. I was trying to think about when did we first show up on the stage together? It could have been back in the Clarence Thomas days for all I know. So I want to well, thank you that. for that pointing that. A little bit before that. your time. But, but, you know, but it was probably Beverly there with me. Yeah. I know Concerned Women yes. for America was there. And I just really appreciate that uh, you would be with us. And I'm going to have to be right back with you and my distinguished panel for more right after this. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well-rested in the morning. That's why I invented MyPillow. 
My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial right now to give you deep discounts, not just on my pillows, but also my mattress topper sheets and so much more. For example, you can get body pillows regularly $89.99, only $29.99 with your promo code. With our 60-day money-back guarantee, you have nothing to lose. Sleep well, America! For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. It's a very important topic because we just showed you and talked to you about some interesting dynamics about this debate. Can we be civil? So I have my panel to help me discuss this. Can we be civil? Some of them think I'm not even civil, so that I do debate. I'm trying to tone it down, but I'm not like Dr. Allen, who's our regular panelist, my rebel. My rebel panelist is also the chief operating officer here at Urban Cure, the Center for Urban Renewal and Education. Welcome, Dr. Allen. A very, very long resume. And I know those of you that that have been following the show for a while probably looked him up and said, wow, no wonder he's so knowledgeable on so many issues, and comes to a conclusion that we can do better than this. In fact, why don't we just rebel? Uh, Henry Olson, I'm trying to get him to say, yeah, we can rebel a little bit more, but he <laughs> thinks that we can persuade. I like him. I like Henry a lot. He's a Washington Post columnist, so some of my friends wonder, well, how could you even like him? How do you even trust him? Because they keep a good guy in the paper, so I'm happy about that. And he's also with the Ethics and Public Policy uh, Institute. Center. I keep wanting to call it an institute, but it's yeah, a center. it's a center. It's a center. Yeah. It's a center because they look at all of the dynamics behind the issues that you think are important, but from a faith perspective, they look at it from a reasonable perspective to say, can we fix what's broken down in our country? So I'm glad you're back. Thank you. You were up in Montana. I was. Wow, yeah. oh, that's pretty cool. It was. Yeah. Uh, it was a little hot, but uh, definitely cool in a uh, cultural sense. Everyone's. Yeah. It's normal up there. It is kind of normal up there. They're, they're, they're gun toters. They're normal people. But you said they're also COVID. They're, they're oh, concerned. Yeah. 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 So that was a good thing that everybody's still kind of being mindful that we're mm -hmm. in a difficult time in our country. And I have a very special guest, Hans. I know you know what? I'm going to tell you, Hans. You have so many letters in your last name. I'm not even going to try to say it, but I know Hans. I've known him for a while. In fact, when anyone wants any information about elections and fraud and voter, uh, uh, the voter dynamics, they go to Hans. And they go to him because he is the expert, uh, law reform uh, initiatives. He's a senior legal fellow at the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. You know the Heritage Foundation are our good friends here at Urban Cure. So we appreciate you being here. Thank and you for having have to me. Tell me, how do you say your last name? It's uh, Von Spakovsky. It's a typical name for somebody from Alabama, you know. You're <laughs> from Alabama. <laughs> Where is the Heritage? What? Uh, I'm first generation. I was actually born, raised in Alabama. My mother was really? German. My really? father was Russian. Really? OK, so this is interesting because yeah, you got a lot of letters there, and it's a uh, Fascinated, and they really did move to Alabama. They actually they met in a refugee camp in Europe at the end of World War II and came to the U.S. and ended up in uh, Alabama. Yeah. Wow, that is really intriguing. And so then you're first generation. That's right. And then you have now made your um, life's work trying to solve some of our most fundamental problems. I'm going to start with you, especially based on what you just told us about your background. Welcome, welcome, and I know these me. guys, so they are, they're getting used to that I will be interruptive sometimes and brash sometimes, but always trying to pry for deeper information because these are some really pressing problems we're having. That's right. And I have argued that we're at the place similar to the 1850s to where we've just totally broken down. So based on your history, are you sensing that any that we can resolve any of these questions, or is this going to get more intense? That debate that we're seeing uh, in the streets and even in the in the public, political arena. I, I think if you look at American history, there have been very very often crucial points in history where there have been very contentious debates about all kinds of issues, inclu including slavery and. I actually think we have been, really now for the past decade, in a in a cold civil war yeah. over uh, everything from Second Amendment rights to abortion to other many other issues, and I hope it doesn't turn into a hot civil war. Uh, although the violence that we have been seeing in cities all over America, and in particular the 
uh, reluctance or refusal of elected uh, officials in those cities to actually do something about that, I, I, I see it as a real problem. We all support uh, peaceful protest. That is part of the American way. It's part of our First Amendment and other constitutional rights. But violence, arson, looting, that is not part of civil debate. And that's something that we have to do something to stop. Okay, I want to ask you, because you mentioned protest, peaceful. I'm wondering now if we can even define protest, because it seems often protest comes with looting, comes with rioting. Yeah, but, but I, I think all you have to do is look back at uh, the civil rights protests of the 60s and Martin Luther King and the, the whole point that they made that we're going, to, we're going to do this peacefully. We are not going to react right. with violence. Right. And that is the way um, you, if you really want to push a particular social movement, that's the way you do it, particularly when you engage in violence. Mm -hmm. um, people who might be sympathetic to what you're, the message you're trying to get across, right. you're right. going to turn them off. And well, in fact, it's that not, what's it's not going to help you. It's yeah. not helping at all, Henry. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's interesting because you always argue that there might be some place that we can reason together. But to Han's point, we're, we're losing that battle in the public square because the venom is so loud now. So I'm wondering, uh, in, in particular on his point, maybe I should save that question for Dr. Allen, so maybe I'll leave it for you as well, Dr. Allen, about that civil rights area that Hans just mentioned. Yes, there was a peaceful protest going on um, with the followers and the le under the leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but there was also tension. I mean, we saw Malcolm X come up there. We saw a whole lot of folks that were saying, no, 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 we're not going to be peaceful. And in the North, I don't think that they were as peaceful as what we saw coming up out of the South. W will you go into the history yeah. of this a little bit? Well, I, yeah, I think one of the things that people uh, did not like at the end of the 60s was that there had been year after year after year of violent riots, violent protest, violent mm -hmm. action, not just in the African American community, but there was the violence outside of this Democratic Convention in 1968. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. That's yeah, right. That, um, and this is yet another example of how a revolutionary few tried to use a moral cause in order to advance an aim that most of those people did not support. Ultimately, what stopped it was the sentiment of the American people and strong leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. that we tend to forget that one of Ronald Reagan's first forays into national consciousness mm -hmm. was standing up to people who were shutting down classrooms yes. at the University of California at Berkeley, yeah. sending the National Guard on campus to ensure that people were not locked out of their classrooms mm -hmm. by sit-ins that were shutting the place down, and standing up for the rule of law. And it, that's the sort of thing that we need today, as somebody in a with a moral framework who can make the distinction between yes. political discussion and political terrorism. Yeah, no, oh, boy, that, political yeah. terrorism. Mm -hmm. well, that's interesting, because you mentioned also the, the debate or the violence that took place at the Democrat convention. But Dr. Allen, there was a lot of debate, if you will, in the Republican, because as uh, Henry Brent mentioned, Ronald Reagan coming to fame, national presence, but Nixon was also there and actually pulled that one out uh, from under him. But that tension was still there. Is, are we at that inflection point? I mean, this cause, as Henry just alluded to, is supposed to be about police brutality. But we're seeing brutality out in the streets against very innocent people. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that we have the leadership that's necessary to get to keep us moving away from the possibility of a hot war. Yeah, don't you think it feels different this time? We lived through the 60s, and we saw people getting their hands blown off, secretaries, I was totally little. innocent. Yes, you were. But, I was the, but, but, but at least uh, Hans <laughs> no, and I remember. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, that's right. Henry was your student, so yes, he was he, a little, yeah, little yeah, right. <laughs> Go ahead, but, tell so us we, about We saw that people time with hands being it. blown off, secretaries, Ouch. totally innocent because Ouch. of people planting bombs willy nilly. But this feels different. Yes, there was violence in the streets, and it continued not just in the 60s, but into the 80s. I mean, we remember still Rodney King and the violence that followed, the violence that, the nine, nine, that, that set 90, you right. off mm -hmm. in the 90s. That's right. Mm -hmm. And yet this feels different somehow. Mm -hmm. so, so we can trace all, all our history, mm -hmm. these moments of peril and crisis, and yet still say this one feels different, and why? Well, we know. use, the word, we use the word protest. We say peaceful yeah. protest. But I ask you to ask a question. What's the difference between peaceful protest and saying amen? 
The people who agree say amen. Right. So what is it the peaceful protesters are saying? Right. There's not an opposite of amen that I'm aware of. Right. But from saying that to violence. You know, I was thinking about that. I was very young at that time, Hans, but we all know that if we were here, and I was here uh, during the 60s, that it was an incredibly tense time. But what Dr. Allen is pointing to, that there's something different. I'm wanting to hear a little bit more because, but I sense that there's something different, too. One of the things that I know is different is that when all of us saw the video of George Floyd, everyone was appalled. That was not in the 50s. That was not in the 60s. So I'm just wondering, are you sensing that this is a little bit different? And if it is different, what, do you, what is your feeling about what has changed that this time we could end up in hot? Well, look, I mean, one of the things we have to point out is, um, uh, look, when there's abusive behavior by police officers, law enforcement, uh, that's something we can't tolerate. But uh, that happens actually very rarely. I mean, there are hundreds of millions of interactions a year between the police and the public, and the number of times that something like that ha happens is, is uh, you can count it on, on two hands. I mean, it's, it's very small. Um, but look, one of the, one of the ways that um, Martin Luther King and others generated sympathy and agreement with their cause was because they did peaceful protests and the violence that occurred was was violence by uh, law enforcement right. against right. them against them and the american public saw that and didn't like that what's going on now is frankly the other way if you look at the videos uh, in places like minneapolis and elsewhere and you see uh, the protesters their violence is being directed at law enforcement. They're trying to burn down federal courthouses. Uh, they're engaging in looting of local businesses. And that in particular is something that I think is very different. Um, they are destroying poor urban neighborhoods with this arson and this looting. The, poor those, urban, they're destroying everything. Do well, they, I, they are, I, but in particular, look, in, particularly in poor urban neighborhoods, the heart of those neighborhoods are small business that's owners. That's right. And those small business owners are, uh, many of them are minorities, they're African Americans, and they're having their businesses destroyed and, and they're being driven out of being able to serve those communities, and that makes no sense whatsoever. Well, it doesn't make sense, but that part we kind of have seen before, Henry, but, uh, but what we haven't seen is where you have, to, to Hans' point, this aggression, not just against the police, but the complicity of, 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 of political officials. I mean, right now in D.C., they're talking about pulling down the Washington Monument. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, one of the things that is different about this time is that this is not just about police brutality. This mm -hmm. is about a long-standing critique mm -hmm. of American society from its top to its core to its bottom, and it's a minority who hold that view, but it's not a tiny minority, no. and they're using this to try and get an agenda passed through means that they would not be able to get right. if they made the argument plainly and Straightforwardly. So they're going to just force us. They're going to go, they'll go to the force exactly, like they do in these sorry, other third world a, countries where yes. you have all like that and stuff like this. That's exactly and so, what's going on. And they want to right. silence dissent and people by. I, I think there's a lot of people who are scared to speak out about scared this because of the violence. Of, well, to be sure. No, I, scared is with a capital S. I mean, frightened, especially what happened out at the White House the other day. I mean, people were dressed up in their in their evening gowns and to come out to that type of terror. This is sure. a different point, Dr. Allen. And I know that I'm going to run out of time to have to go through break, but I want you just in a minute to just lead up to when I can come back to you and say, what is it that you're sensing? Uh-oh, I don't even have the time for you to do that. That's it. They're getting ready to put, but I want you to, you got to think about this with me. Yeah. And you've got to wait with us because we have some very, very important information to tell you on the other side, not just about the problem, but about the solution right after this. It's time for a cure. Cure is a coalition of new voices with new ideas that will become new policies. We are the cure. The Center for Urban Renewal and Education, headquartered in Washington, D.C., CURE works with churches, political, and business leaders on behalf of urban communities. CURE's mission is to address issues of culture, race, and poverty from a Judeo-Christian perspective. CURE, join with us. Under the new administration, there has never been a better time to help black communities.
I said we're going to have to find answers, and we know that the answers are in the scriptures, but I need some help from my right. panel as well to pull the truth out into this debate. So I have Dr. Allen. Dr. William Allen is with us, the Chief Operating Officer of Urban Cure. Thank you again for staying over. Henry Olson is with us. He's back from Montana on his way to Alaska, mm -hmm. so he has joined us. And Henry, you know, for those of you that don't know, he writes every single day for the Washington Post, so it takes him all over the place. So we're very honored that he spends his time sharing with you his insights into these very complicated questions. So thank you uh, thank for you. doing that with us on a much regular basis than you probably uh, should schedule. I don't know what your editors are saying over there for. <laughs> Where are you during that time? And then our very special guest, Hans. Hans is from the Heritage Foundation. He is an expert mostly in election fraud, all the election information. Uh, you must be really busy right now, too. I, I am. Oh, boy, I bet you're busy. Well, thank you for coming and talking to us, because we're trying to pull out of your expertise on the, on the, the legal aspects, looking at what is breaking down in this culture right now, uh, and uh, can we get to civil debate, which actually is, which actually is in your uh, wheelhouse, because we're supposed to be waiting for the election, not riding in the streets like we're seeing right now. So right. I appreciate you being here on this. Um, Dr. Allen, uh, we were talking a little bit before the break about how this is different. Yes. And I'm just wondering, have we reached a tipping point that this is similar to in the 1850s, that these conflicting worldviews are just not going to reconcile, and we may be beyond the place where we'll be able to just get along, maybe yes. reason together. I think it's different in a special way, different from the 1850s, in that today there is no common deliberation, i.e. we can't talk to one another. Right. In the 1850s, yes, you debated whether the Declaration of Independence was a lie or the truth, but you could still talk to one another about it. There was still public deliberation. We're losing public deliberation. We're so at odds and so unwilling to trust to the good sense of the community that those who are now carrying out the revolution and they believe it's a revolution mm -hmm. are rejecting the possibility of public discourse as part of the solution. That's why it feels different. Mm -hmm. There is no longer any confidence in public discourse. It is a cause, though. There, there is a cause. And, you know, during the 1850s, I think what I was thinking about that did heat up to where there was debate, even in the in the center. Remember when uh, what was it Brooks beat up Sumner? Yeah, so, right. I mean, yeah. and then he got canes when he went back. Everybody sent him canes, and so go beat up the rest of those abolitionists because we hate them. So it did reach a tipping point uh, that led then up to the Civil War. But there was a cause. The cause was slavery. Henry, I, what is the cause? So you you mentioned maybe police brutality a little bit, but I. Is there something that's so broken down in our society that it needs this type of attention well, and rage? That, I think that is the dispute, that there are people who believe that American society is and has been for a long time, in some cases back to its founding, depending mm -hmm. who makes the mm -hmm. argument, fundamentally corrupt and needs to be cleansed from top to bottom. And there are people who believe that America is fundamentally just and needs to be defended from top to bottom. Yes. And being politics, there's all sorts of ranges mm -hmm. of viewpoints in between. Mm -hmm. And it's in those ranges of viewpoints in between that we have the opportunity to try and come to some sort of solution. Right. But the more we divide it into two irreconcilable camps, mm -hmm. which is what you had to do with the morality of slavery, because either a black man is or is not a person, you can't, you can't compromise right. on that. That's mm -hmm. right. Then um, if we are, have only two options, then people who hold two irreconcilable views cannot live together peacefully. One must dominate the other. And that's the fear, is that yeah. the side that believes America is fundamentally corrupt right. sees this, believes this, and will not stop until they do dominate. But, but Hans, this, that seems so subjective, though. Slavery, we knew. This is person or not. But in, in systematic racism, inherently unjust, it's just so subjective. How, how are we going to solve this problem uh, if there's no def definition of what the exact problem is? Well, I mean, I have to agree with what Henry's saying. I mean, one, one of the big problems I find here is, um, look, in order to have civil debate and civil discourse, uh, you have to have an attitude that uh, your opponent, you disagree with them um, because you think they're wrong on the issue. 
not because you believe they're evil or have an evil motive, but I have to tell you, one of the problems I run into all the time mm -hmm. uh, on uh, particularly uh, uh, election issues, which I deal with a lot, <laughs> yeah, is um, because uh, folks will disagree with me on, on how elections should be run, they also uh, personally a attack me, right. thinking I must have an evil motive. Right, right. And I don't have that view on these issues. I just mm -hmm. think people who disagree with me on certain issues, they're, they're just wrong okay. on the policy. Okay. I don't think they have evil motives. But okay. there's, uh, you see this attitude a lot, uh, particularly from, I think, from those who think this, this country basically is evil incarnate right. and, and, right. and right. has been since, since its founding. And that's part of this cancel culture Oh, yeah. Destroying our history. Uh, D.C. just put up a list of all these names that need to be changed uh, yeah. in D.C. of right. locations. And yes. one of them was of, of, I think, a school named after Alexander Graham Bell, who yes. invented the telephone. Right. Well, the last yeah. time I saw, I didn't realize <laughs> that the invention of the telephone was somehow racist. And I don't understand <laughs> why, why, why that, that name <laughs> needs to be changed. But it's not for that reason, but because anybody who came from Connecticut, as he did, was too close to the slave trade. Oh, is that what I'm talking about? The Puritans, that's the thing, there's just no consistency in this, and I right. think that that is hurting us. And I'm just wondering, Dr. Allen, uh, Hans mentioned the, the, you know, that those on the left seem to just really think that this is evil and, and everybody yes. that's associated with it. Is this something that that the right should consider? I mean, there is a, a scripture that says that there's an abomination to each other. Have we been too nice on the other side to not say no to you looting in the street? I mean, look, an author in defense of looting yeah. and it's being taken seriously? That MPR would actually think that this book should be taken seriously? But the way to read that defense of looting is to say we have no reason to put confidence in our institutions and laws. Mm -hmm. That's what it really means. Wow. It means that we cannot exist in peace on the basis of the law that has been established. That's why I said it feels different. Yeah, but the lawlessness is, in looting is against someone that has nothing to do with the structures to be. If they really want to get rid of, take on, a, well, maybe that's why they're fighting the police, you know, because Precisely. they're also fighting the police. But I think that this destruction of personal property, you know, this is a violation of the fundamental core values that we say that we all What adhere. protects property? Law and order. Yeah. Right. And a gun. You mentioned the gun earlier. Yeah. The Second and, Amendment. Who mentioned yeah. that? I think I, I, think, I, I think I did. I did. And, and, but and, that's not law. That's what that's you right. do when you don't have When you don't have law. law. Ooh, ouch. Right. Yes. I mean, let's remember the, 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 the Jimmy Stewart, John Wayne movie, the... Uh, um, Liberty. The, man, the man who shot Liberty. Shot the man who shot the Liberty. I don't know that yeah. you're able to mention uh, John Wayne's name because they don't want him either. But go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's that the whole point of the movie is that Jimmy Stewart comes to. It's a parable about how to form a democratic polity. Yes. And Stewart comes from the east and he's naive and he tries to teach this town how to live according to law, mm -hmm. but there's this bandit who t has terrorized the town, and it's not until he enlists the aid of basically an amoral shooter, mm -hmm. who is John Wayne, that force becomes united with right, and might and right together create that. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the absence of law, the gun is the answer. And it But is. that's not how democratic free people govern themselves. But that right. isn't, but I don't know that uh, even others, it seems like most, even the most primitive of civilizations have some type of order and law. They might not be rooted in a constitution similar to ours, but there, there have always been a right from wrong, might not been defined the way that we think it should be. What, do we, what are you thinking and what were your thoughts before Henry uh, well, was telling us about it? If, if, if I could tell a quick story, okay. uh, and this really has to do with the idea of civil discourse, is mm -hmm. my father was Russian, okay, and he mm -hmm. escaped. He escaped communist Russia, fortunately got out. But he once now, What told, year was that? 1921. Okay, so go ahead. Very young man. But okay. he once said to me that uh, you can't establish a uh, democracy, you can't have civil discourse when the people on the other side, rather than talking to you, mm -hmm. are willing to show up at your house in the middle of the night and right. kill you. And that's what that and that's what the revolution was like in 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 Russia. Wow! Yeah. And uh, you cannot have civil discourse when you have individuals out there who are in the streets trying to burn down buildings right, right. and There's break no into reason. break into businesses right, right. and um, to to engage in violence that that is you're you're not going to have the kind of democratic debate that we should have about important issues when that's going on well 
thank God your father had somewhere to go. Where yes. do we go? What, what do we do? How do well, we, the, where are we going to There isn't any place well, else then what to go, do we do is to there? Stop this. And I want each of you to take a minute. We've got to think of one thing that needs to be done so that we can put these two-year-olds back in the little timeout that they belong in before they destroy this country. Well, as, as Henry has said, law and order is very important. And what we have to make clear is that while we support peaceful protests and peaceful debate, we will not tolerate the kind of violence that's going on. And you have to have a tough response yeah, to stop saying, that from happening. Well, then maybe we have to suspend peaceful protests for a little while, the same way they suspended all the rest of our freedoms to, uh, during the COVID. I don't even understand how these two-year-olds got out. They were supposed to be in the house under COVID. What would you think we should do? Well, look, what we need to do is establish, you know, that the law reigns supreme, which means enforcing the law, which means putting people who are violating the law, who are killing, injuring, maiming, and looting in, in prison. But, but how, in when you had like the, the, what was it, the, the, the chief of police the, was saying one thing out in Seattle, but the mayor was saying something. How? How were they going to reconcile that? Well, at some point, the president and the federal government needs to decide whether or not they're going to invoke the Posse Comitatus Act and, mm -hmm. is, and take away the, the local authorities' sort of. preemptive right to enforce the laws in their own community. Mm -hmm. One hopes it doesn't come to that, but if this continues unabated, and that's one of the things that's different about the 60s is you would have these sporadic riots, mm -hmm. but they weren't continually organized in the same location. You would yeah, have somebody right. come up yeah. and it would be a spasm, a paroxysm right. of, of, of yeah. anger, right. and then it would fade away. Right. What is quite clear is you have an organized, systematic, yeah, right. targeted well, effort funded. to destabilize. Precisely. Well funded. Well, I argue today that what the president should do, in my column today being Wednesday, is what the president should do is that if people are doing this in an organized way, they're almost certainly violating various federal laws, right. not the least right. of them is the Racketeering and Corruption Act. Oh, wow. Start a federal investigation into federal laws so yes. that peaceful protests and paroxysms get dealt with on the local basis, but a use of communications, crossing state lines, creating an organization that is effectively funding its operations through theft, that's all against that's federal, that's federal law, law. And he so doesn't yeah. need the chief of police right. to Well, deal that's with true, that. but there was, right. he, there was pushback, and he backed up. And now is saying, you have to ask me to come yeah. in, Dr. Well, remember Allen. what the president told us about the border. He says, if you don't have a border, you don't have a country. Right. That's also true internally. Okay. If you don't sustain order, you don't have a country. Mm -hmm. The first thing is to remember, if I remember correctly, Second Chronicles 1014, if my people humble themselves and pray. Mm -hmm. I think that we can't forget the importance of calling upon the Lord in this time. Yeah. But at the same time, rising up mm -hmm. and taking responsibility for order in the society. If there are those who have rejected the possibility of life under the Constitution and the law as we know it, mm -hmm. it is up to us, as we said last time, to cancel them through our vote, right. to reject them, to right. speak stridently against them. Yeah, especially through our vote, but I'm wondering in between now, that's, that's going to be a long 60 days or so. So I'm wondering if in the meantime, what, when you were talking, I thought it was locking arms with the policemen and, and encouraging them in some way yeah. uh, that, that we the people are with them. Because what we don't want to see is what happened up there in Kenosha where someone got shot, or, you know, where right. that they're trying to defend themselves. I don't want that to happen again, to where people are going out there on their own and then they fight back, and then we have more suits. Yeah, you don't want when anyone to be shot, but people must remember some who will stand up will be, and we must be ready for that, oh. prepared for it. Whoa. Yeah, but defend, the thing I would say about Portland and Kenosha over the last week is defend your own property. Don't go trying to defend others. Don't become a replacement National Guard as a private action. That's a recipe for disaster. Oh, it was. I'll be right back. Hello, I'm Mike Bendell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well rested in the morning. That's why I invented MyPillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. 
I'm interrupting this commercial right now to give you deep discounts, not just on my pillows, but also my mattress topper sheets and so much more. For example, you can get body pillows regularly, $89.99, only $29.99 with your promo code. With our 60-day money-back guarantee, you have nothing to lose. Sleep well, America! For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. I don't know how we solve all the problems in uh, what's going on right now, this lack of civil debate. So in the wrap-up segment, I thought I'd introduce you to two um, journalists. We're going to talk to some journalists so that we can look at the 35,000 view, uh, feet view. Uh, and both of my friends, Brandon uh, Showalter is back with us from the Christian Post. And he's a reporter there. And then a dear friend I haven't seen in a while and hasn't been on yet, John Gizzi. John is at Newsmax. He is a chief political columnist and a White House correspondent. And you may have seen him in the White House if you watch the White House briefings, because John always asks a question, and the president always calls on him. And not just this president. When Barack Obama was there, he'd call on him. And every president, for how many years you've had your passes to do that. So I really appreciate you being here, uh, because we've, we've collapsed. Everyone's agreeing that we've collapsed. Our civil discourse with what we're seeing in the street. So I want to get your opinion, John, and then I'll come to you, Brandon, uh, as a reporter, as a columnist, as someone that is looking at these issues more broadly, what should we be thinking about, in particular those that are uh, basically churchgoers who are watching this right now? Well, I think one has to look at just where churchgoers will be affected by the secular world of politics. And that can range from issues uh, such as abortion to the school situation where uh, charter schools or even the V word vouchers might be impacted on who holds office mm -hmm. in the years ahead. And uh, just freedom of association, frankly, and not to mention the tax status of churches, which can always be impacted by who's in charge who's in, in government. Charge. But you mentioned the freedom of association. Now, that's interesting, because when you think about what has broken down right now, uh, where we're seeing the rioting, the looting, yeah. the protests in the street, some of it is against just a association, people that want to just be a part of this administration, people that want to just um, go out to dinner. I mean, it has gotten really, really difficult. So, in fact, I'm going to ask you, Brandon, because you've been following this very closely, uh, including uh, this recent book that is getting a lot of praise in defense of looting. Are we really reduced to that level? Well, I think what we're seeing, for more broadly philosophical, on a, more, on a more broadly philosophical note, is the toxic, poisonous fruit of postmodernism, mm -hmm. where language has been completely deconstructed, where we don't even agree on what words mean anymore. Yeah. Uh, the author of this book, who was interviewed in NPR, that's our tax dollars, right. you know, funding this, right. uh, this book, In Defense of Looting, that's the title, was written by a biological male who says he's a woman. And so, it's beginning with a lie. I mean, we as Christians, as churchgoers, I think need to insist upon the integrity of language mm -hmm. and refuse to bow the knee to altering our sense of reality. Uh, it, it is not a surprise to me that someone who does not live in the material reality of our humanness is advocating that looting can be okay. Because I guarantee you, if someone looted his house, his small business, he wouldn't be okay with it. Uh -huh. This is nonsense from the start, yeah. and we need to reject it in total. Well, I'm wondering then if we're going to take the language back. John, you mentioned schools. Mm -hmm. well, we, we, for the last 60, 70 years, have agreed with this idea that we can pool our resources and educate other people's children in a public environment, a public school with a curriculum that was supposed to agree with our common values. There is nothing common about the values that uh, this author would have with those that take seriously the Bible. So is this where we should be thinking to go, get an up out of that uh, relationship with others in our schools and re-educate children in basic truths? In a perverse kind of way, Star, the COVID-19 may have shown us the way mm -hmm. in the sense that we argue about whether schools will reopen. Uh, former Vice President Biden just referred to it as a national crisis recently. And yet, 
if homeschools had reached mm -hmm. the level that they should have been had they not been forced to fight every step of the way, yeah, sure. the problem would be resolved. Right. And right. similarly, uh, the voucher program, That's which right. has become so controversial money and so demonized. To the school's parents want. Exactly. So you're thinking the voucher now should follow them even home and uh, into any environment? And, yes. And there is a possibility for that, well, I suppose, with the Espinosa decision that came out of the Supreme Court recently. Mm -hmm. uh, is this something that you would advocate? Uh, in the Christian post, is, is this work? It almost seems like where else would Christians go to try to get that language back, to get, it, get our culture back to where it is civil, is to just start a whole new generation thinking um, about we're going, other values. I think we're going to have to really dig deep and mm -hmm. reconstitute families and let the home be at the center of the economy. Uh, now, I, I recognize that that's not possible for everyone, but I think we're going to have to really reconsider just how much power we have deferred to state entities. Not saying that it's all bad. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, in, in good conscience, I think there are some public school districts that are particularly mm -hmm. egregious, and I wouldn't feel safe yeah, sending my kids you, there. But yeah. it, we, we really need to get grounded and rethink a lot of things. And I think I would agree that COVID has given us a golden opportunity to reconsider a lot of that. Well, it has. Um, but now you're talking on a personal level. But you're a correspondent here in Washington. You know that these wheels turn very slowly if they oh. turn at all. So are, are, are people going to see any kind of relief to say, let us live free again? The, 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 the riots are coming to a town near them. Mm -hmm. I do think if individuals take it upon themselves to launch a movement and not give up, uh, then yes, this endeavor can be reached. Mario Vargas Llosa, the Peruvian novelist, used to say that uncertainty is a flower whose petals have yet to be picked. Hmm. And this <laughs> is where we stand now with the alternative forms uh, to public education. And I do think that if some people began to pursue it, it would go somewhere, wow. and the uncertainty would end. That's interesting, because we got a lot of uncertainty, so maybe it's the time to throw the brick against the wall. Hey, everything's falling apart anyway. Should we try everything new? Well, I, I, like I said, I think we, we really need to get creative and start afresh with a lot of things, mm -hmm. because as I was just saying a moment ago, with respect to the deconstruction of language and how yeah. we need to insist on, we have to be able to yeah. have a, very, a means of communication where we can even have discourse in this country. Mm -hmm. it's, it's over ready, and as the inestimable British historian Paul Johnson has pointed out, yeah, those who abuse language, yeah. totalitarians of history, will abuse humans when given the opportunity. Yeah. We need to wake up and see that this is not just a game. Right. You know, reality itself is at stake, and that's not hyperbole. No, it isn't at all, and that's what I think a lot of people are realizing now when they're seeing at night after night the tension, and with what happened the other day at the White mm -hmm. House, this is unacceptable. But you're in there all the time with colleagues, I guess you would call right. them, fellow journalists that don't even believe these truths. So I want to thank you both for being with me, um, because we're going to keep exploring them here on Cure America with Star Parker, and I'm glad that you're going to explore them with us, because we've got to do something more differently, uh, or we are going to lose our country, because because we have lost the language. I'll be right back with some final thoughts. Today, a student in public school will pray or lead a Bible study. Today, a pastor will preach boldly the truth of the scriptures without fear of the IRS. Today, the life of an innocent child will be saved and a mother will experience the joy of a newborn baby. A distraught woman will find hope and choose life rather than death. Today, there is a strong voice defending God's created natural order of marriage and family. There is a defender of freedom in the courtroom and in the halls of Congress and in legislative bodies across the land. Today, all of this is possible because of the ministry of Liberty Council. People from all over America will find help and hope because of Liberty Council. The adversity they face will be turned into victory. Case by case, law by law, person by person, Liberty Council is advancing religious freedom, the sanctity of human life, and the family through litigation, education, and public policy. And that is the mission of Liberty Council to restore the culture by advancing life, liberty, and family. Well, a lot of interesting things to think about. Well, you can play it over and over again, too, because we have to think about these critical questions in front of us. 
I know for myself personally, I love reading a proverb chapter every day. Some of them are actually quite funny, especially Proverbs 29, because it speaks a lot about foolishness. And in fact, one verse says, if a wise man contends with a foolish man, whether the fool rages or laughs, there is no peace. Another says a fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. I simply cannot conduct civil discourse with someone who does not see the core value that private property is sacred, derived from the biblical principle, thou shalt not steal or thou shalt not covet. The idea that private property is sacred, that theft is sinful, is fundamental to the core truths enshrined in our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. So to attack these principles is to attack a common value structure upon which our country is built. And this is at core of the rage we are seeing expressed in our politics and in our streets today. Those protesting, harassing, looting are not expressing displeasure about police brutality. They are expressing displeasure about America. Their objective is not to solve the problem of police brutality, but to tear down the Christianity and the capitalism and the Constitution that America represents. It's hard today to wrap ourselves around the tensions and passions and angers that led to our nation's civil war. And it's even harder to think we as a nation could be once again at such an inflection point. But I think we are. And I'm convinced that this is a time for vigilance, that those who care about America as a free nation under God must be engaged. It is a time for freedom lovers to concede no turf and to fight for the truths and the values that we desire exhibited in the public square for our grandchildren. But do not answer a fool according to his folly, says a proverb, lest you also be like him. So I think the best way to answer in defense of looting is in the voting booth, so to express our common values in defense of civil debate. I'm Star Parker. Thank you for joining me yet another week on this exciting time with Cure America, which we will do. See you again next week.